come back together again to begin our study in uh, Hebrews uh, chapter 2, beginning with uh, verse 12. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Uh, Lord, uh, may we come tonight, Lord, and be able to put the cares of the world aside just for a moment, Lord, that we would be able to commune with you in spirit, Lord, and also in your written word. And Lord, may the spirit, Lord, interpret and apply, Lord, as we each have need, uh, as we are desperately uh, seekers of you to be the guiding light in our life. Lord, may we leave this place more like Jesus than when we came. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. When we read the book of Hebrews, and I've mentioned this already, it's very important for us to understand that the writer is writing from a Hebrew perspective to Hebrews with a similar or if not identical perspective and background and so it's it's very important for us to understand some of the basic things uh, about how Hebrews would understand God uh, how Hebrews would understand the sacrificial systems and things of that nature and tonight uh, when we get into verse 12 13 and 14 we begin to get into a little bit of these things uh, that might need some explanation so if uh, your ear turns a little bit or something comes to your mind like a question uh, don't hesitate to, to raise your hand and just say hey what was that or how does that work or anything of that nature so don't be hesitant to do that uh, I'll I promise you I'll stop in a few seconds if not a minute and uh, we'll, we'll look at what we got there uh, in the question that you might have about the text Again, like I said, we're going to start tonight in verse 12. I always like to go back a little bit and read. So we'll start reading in verse 11, and then we'll go through 12 and 13. And that's the end of the paragraph there, verse 10 through 14 or 13. So verse 11 says, For both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one Father, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brethren. In the midst of the congregation I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children whom God has given me. So that's the text for this evening. In your translation do you have a, a difference in the text when it comes to verse 11 then you have a verse 12 and 13 is there a difference in how it's printed on the page or printed on the you know electronic copy that you might have any indentation differences uh, in the text at all how about cross references okay most, most Bibles are easily cross-referenced. If you have a text, for example, and you have a little shift, like when you're, when you're typing your letters on your word processor, you hit tab, and it goes over you know, about a half an inch or so or whatever, um, the text in should have that type of in indication, or it should have capitalization in verse 12. And what that's indicative of is a quote of an Old Testament passage. And so... Uh, anybody have a clue to what passage we begin with there in verse 12? Psalms 22, that's right, that's right. Now, but we'll turn to Psalms 22 in just a second, but I want to say something about Psalm 22. You might not be familiar with Psalm 22 on one hand, but you are. You are. Because one of the seven words from the cross was the beginning of Psalm 22. And it's important for us to realize that Psalm 22 begins with woe and despair, but ends with exaltation and exhilaration of an assured uh, salvation. Also, it's important for us to understand that, you know, we didn't have chapters originally in the Old Testament, just like we didn't originally have chapters. It were paragraphs and pages. Psalm 22 and Psalm 23 are actually part of the same psalm. Now, you know Psalm 23, right? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. 
That also sounds like a lot what would go with these words here. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. Or, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Uh, yea, though I walk through the shadow of the valley of death. You see what I'm saying? And so Psalms 22 and 23. So let's turn to Psalms 22 uh, right now. And we'll, we'll begin to uh, understand a little bit better the connection between these two uh, here. Psalm 22. And I'm turning there as you are as well. And look at the first verse, just so you can look at that. Uh, this is the, one of the seven words from the cross that Jesus uttered. Uh, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? forsaken me? Far from my deliverance are the words of my groaning. So he's saying, man, I'm so far away from deliverance and salvation, it's not even funny. But the verse that's being quoted here in Hebrews, remember we're doing this comparison, uh, or this, sometimes it's a comparison for contrast, and sometimes it's a comparison for likeness sakes. And we're doing a comparison for likeness sake in this point, and look at verse 22. And he says, I will tell your name to my brethren, in the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. That's the, full, that's the full verbiage that's taken here. I will proclaim your name to my brethren. In verse 12, in the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And here's the comparison of likeness. Jesus is being equated. Okay, This is the one that's been talked about. He was the author of the salvation that was coming. He is being equated to being your and my brethren. So again, it's another comparison of likeness. Jesus was made human, like a human, not only just like a human, but he was made like a brother or a sister to us because he had the form of human flesh. Hey, Barb. Hey, Tim. So th this is a comparison. Again, this is a comparison of likeness, not contrast. And so he's being compared to us. And as we know, Philippians 2, uh, two weeks ago, I said, if you want to see some comparison in the way Paul looked at it about Jesus' likeness, you know, Jesus has said there in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through 11, he says he didn't think that equality with God is something to be grasped or maintained or held on to, but he emptied himself, meaning that he set aside his divine privilege and he took on the likeness of a servant. O other words, flesh, human, human likeness. He added to himself human likeness. And now he's being called one of the brethren, just like you're called brother, you're called sister. He's called one of the brethren. So he's like us in that regard. Not only is he like us in that regard, he says, I will proclaim your name to my brethren. And that's exactly what Jesus did in his earthly mission, didn't he? He said, I didn't come to do my own will, but to do the will of him who sent me. He said, the, the well have no need of a physician, but it's the sick. I came to heal. I came to find. I came to, you know, give salvation. I came to give life. And so that's what he did, literally, uh, in the midst of the congregation, is what the next sentence goes. And it says, in the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. Now, we don't have anything um, but one place that I know of where we see Jesus uh, quite likely was singing in the scripture. I'm not sure this is a literal inference to singing. I think it might be more of a testimonial kind of idea. But remember on the night it says that they had prayed after the, the Last Supper? They sang as they crossed the Kidron Valley going to the Mount of Olives. So they sang. And so uh, that's one thing that we could say, that we could affirm that in the midst of the congregation I will sing your praise. But I think the more important word there in verse 12 here, or yeah, in verse 12, is the word congregation. The word congregation. You can't tell it from your text in English. But Jesus throughout all of the New Testament, the quotations that Jesus quoted, more often than not, 
were quotations from the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament called the Septuagint. The word congregation there is the Greek word ekklesia. It's not in the Hebrew text like that. It's not like that at all. The significance of that, okay, the significance of Jesus using and quoting the Septuagint is this. It gives it divine stamp of approval. If Jesus quoted the Greek translation of the Hebrew Scriptures, how much more approval do you really need? You see, what, what will happen many times is people will downplay the Greek translation of the Old Testament Hebrew Scriptures. Now, it, the, the Scriptures were primarily Hebrew. There were some Aramaic in Daniel, for example. And people downplay them, and it's important not to do that when Jesus used them primarily in his quotations. And I think one of the reasons why it's fitting that he would use it here is because the word in Greek that's used, that's translated in English, ek, uh, is um, ekklesia. That's the word where we get church from. And in one sense here, you can look forward at this statement and say that, all right, Jesus is looking at this word and he chose this word for the specific, for the intent purpose of speaking to who? The church. Because he is speaking to the brethren, the sentence fragment right above it, and he's speaking to the larger corpus of the entire church when he says, I will do this in the midst of the congregation. I will praise. Okay? I will sing praise in the midst of the congregation. So he's singing in the church. So, this might not seem like a, a great watershed moment, but man, I get excited when I see these little things and when I learn these little things uh, about how the Savior used uh, the Scriptures in His speaking and how other authors seem to key in on that when they use the Scriptures as well. Remember, it's the Holy Spirit who divinely inspired the writer to use the Septuagint. And the Septuagint, though we don't put it in the same class all the time as the Hebrew Scripture, is on par because Jesus gave it his stamp of approval using it so many times. And that's really uh, a, a, an important thing because there's mu many more. Now, I understand Greek a whole lot better than I do Hebrew, and so that's really helpful to me as a teacher and as a pupil and as a student of the Word. So he said, I will proclaim your name to my brethren. So he's equated himself to you and to I. And then he said, in the midst of the church, I will sing your praise. And remember, in Psalm 22, the beginning of Psalm 22 started out pretty bad. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And now in verse 22, he's talking about singing, proclaiming to the brothers, to the congregation. And so the writer here is saying something here in this fact. Not only is Jesus like us because he's made in humanity like us, in fashion like in humanity like us, but he's also a, a, an example to us that we ought to proclaim and praise in the midst of the congregation. It's a mighty sad thing that you can't have not just humor or jocularity, but have joy and praise in an assembly of believers. It's a pretty sad thing. Now, I know that I'm preaching to the choir here somewhat, but to stand up there and to sing, sometimes it's disheartening to look out here at the expressions on some of the people's faces. It's like, you know, you just serve bitter lemonade, you know, sometimes. And I've heard others say this, and maybe Billy's even said this. Is not, his primary job as a worship leader is not to be a cheerleader. And it's easy to get that attitude that if I'm happy and I'm smiling, everybody else ought to be happy and smiling. You know, and what's wrong with you out there and whatnot? And I'm just saying that because I know that the choir is here, so to speak, tonight. And I want to encourage you, just 
don't, don't get lost in that idea. You'd be almost better off sometimes, I believe, to, to be blind like Logan Carson was at Southeastern Seminary and just looking for something that you couldn't see and just not paying attention to anything else because you were just giving it all to him. You were just praising him the whole time. That's right. That's right. That's right. So sometimes it's not about who's out there, the reason that we're up here doing the things that we're doing, as much as we ought to be thinking about him up there. You know, if you've been called to be a minister through music, you know, whether that's a title or whether that's a thing that you participate in with others, you know, that's a minister to who? In one as aspect, it's a minister of encouragement to the people. But in another aspect, it's a worship event for you to praise him. So what I would say to that is and I've seen that in people who would come for a short period of time and, and experience that and they would allow that to be the dominant theme and experience that they have. And what I would encourage people, again, is like Cleji said, is why, who are you here for? You know, it's, it's really, and, and I don't remember, there's a song, it's an audience of one. I'm <laughs> the other hand, but very affected by music. I mean, you could not preach a sermon, I would do the same, and I would, I would get, a, I think I would get a lot from that. Because music means something to me. Yeah. And it's very big worship for me. But there's a lot of people that music just doesn't do it for them. They have no emotion towards it whatsoever. I mean, yeah. none of it, any kind. <laughs> I know Mr. Music. Mr. Merritt loved music, you know, tremendously. And, uh, he loved a lot of different music, not just, you know, uh, this or that. But there's, there's people that get into a genre of music, and if it's not there, it's not going to move them at all. And so it's possible that you could be off their, you know, musical interest track and be, you know, in, in that area too, and it makes it difficult. And so it, it's, it's funny how we want things that we're comfortable with and things that we like and, 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 and whatnot. And I'm very careful to also remember, and I was thinking this is where you were going, is that you know, we, we do carry so much stuff with us all the time. And when we come in the doors of the sanctuary here, I think we carry as much, if not more, into this place and it's hard to escape that and so uh, one of our prayer requests tonight will be a good example of that and I'll not comment any more on that but sometimes we're so burdened that it's hard for us to smile it's hard for us to worship and praise and if we're not careful um, we can become that way conditioned in, in certain ways because of how life has come to us and how we reacted to life. You know, and, and you know, like James said in James 1, he says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you encounter various trials. He's not saying be joyous for the trials. 
But in spite of the trials, like Dr. Bennett said, are you going to live on top of life's circumstances or are circumstances going to live on top of you? And I understand that we all flip-flop. We, we all do that back and forth from time to time. But after a while, the pendulum seems to stop for some people mm -hmm. and get stuck under circumstances and situations and, and whatnot. You know, and, and sometimes that's of their doing and sometimes it's not. I mean, let me just give you an example. I mean, what happens when, you know, your, your son or daughter commits suicide? That's the end of people's lives sometimes. I know good people, Christian people, that, that have lost children like that. I mean, committed suicide. And it basically took them down to nothing. And it, it I know one in particular, I think, that has just never really ever recovered. There's no more joy there. And so, you know, for whatever reason, circumstances after the fact and whatnot, it's difficult. It's difficult. But on the other hand, you know, where is our hope? Where does our joy come from? What's the source of joy? What's the source of our overcoming? Uh, that needs to be built up. And so if we as brothers and sisters in Christ aren't there to help people, uh, point to those things and, and depend on those things and walk alongside them through that, then we're not really being the body of Christ that we ought to be. I, I, so, something similar to that, it's, it's, it's not quite the same, but something similar to that I've heard of, and you brought it back to my memory. Um, I don't remember where I heard it or how long ago I heard it, but was to write that down, whatever that thing that's burdening you. And then when you come in, you get, you, in this particular case, what they're doing, they were putting it in a box. And then that box would be open and those things would be shared and people would be given that little piece of paper and you would pray for that one thing. And that's what you would concentrate on, whether it was in that service or throughout the week or whatever. But the idea that you're talking about is basically, you know, when you come in the door, you've got something on your mind, you, you write that down, you put it in a basket, you come to the altar, and maybe that is... Let me ask you a question. Yeah. Let me ask you, how many went back up there and took your piece of paper back out? Nobody. Okay. Not that I saw. He left them all over there. Yeah. yeah. That's what we do many times is when we, when we pray and we ask for help or whatever, you know, a lot of times we get up with the same burden that we got down with, you know. And uh, sometimes that's the way it'll happen. That, that'll be because sometimes, you know, What's God's famous three answers to prayer? Yes, no, and wait. Mm -hmm. We're not very good waiters, are we? No. And so sometimes that, that answer is long to come before we get there. The text continues tonight in verse 13, which is, again, another quote from an Old Testament passage. It can either be 2 Samuel or I believe it's actually Isaiah uh, eight seventeen. 
And the writer writes here again, and he says, And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children whom God has given me. So I want to look a little bit at these two quotes here. Turn to Isaiah 8.17 first. So Isaiah 8, 17 in the New American Standard reads and says, And I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob. I will even look eagerly for him. Now, we need to know the context here. Isaiah was writing a group of people who... The Lord was trying to communicate that they had lost their way. They had fallen uh, not out of his grace per se, but they had fallen into a terrible sin habit. So when you can't, you know, uh, have an honest answer from the priests, when you can't get, you know, an honest, thus saith the Lord from those who are supposed to be the Lord's representatives, he selects Isaiah and says, you go tell these people that in X number of years, they're going to be in deep stuff because I'm going to put them in captivity. And so this is the background for the book of Isaiah pretty much throughout. He goes on, and so that's why he's saying here in verse 16, he says, bind up the testimony and seal the law among my disciples, and I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face. Because the blessing of the Lord was no longer on uh, 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 Judah nor Israel. Remember that Israel, the ten tribes, the northern tribes, went in captivity in 722 B.C. After that, Judah and Benjamin, the last two tribes of the twelve tribes, in 586 B.C. went into captivity. First the Assyrians came, then the Babylonians came. And so the Lord is not blessing them as he had blessed them in times past. And he's saying here that he had gave all this information and uh, the, the, the prophets, the false prophets were saying, God is with us. And, and Isaiah is saying, man, you guys have read this all wrong. You have been false prophets. You've not represented the Lord. And so he's going in here and he's saying, you know, this is what, this, this is what we're telling you. This is the truth. And the writer here is saying, and I will wait on the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob. I will even look eagerly for him. Now, fast forward, how's the quote being used over here? He says, and again, I will put my trust in him. That's not precisely what the text says in the New American Standard. But the essence of what he is saying is there. He said, I'm going to wait for him. He says, eagerly wait or look uh, eagerly for him and what's he going to look for what are you going to look for the Lord his blessing his deliverance and so the writer is saying here he says I will put my trust in him then he says and again behold I and the children whom God has given me go back to Isaiah again to verse 18 he says behold I and the children whom the Lord has given me are as signs and wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwells on Mount Zion. Did you ever consider yourself to be a sign? Or a sign and wonder? Let me ask a simpler question. Did you ever consider yourself to be a saint? But if you're a New Testament Christian, you are both a saint and you're both a sign and a wonder. Let me explain. Remember this whole thing about being brothers or brethren with Christ? It comes because of salvation that he purchased because of the act of faith to put your trust in him. The new birth makes you a sign and a wonder. It makes you actually literally a miracle. And that's what miracles in the Gospel of John are called. As a matter of fact, 
Gospel of John is called the Book of Signs. And so when we think about miracles being equated with signs, the new birth that you experienced when you became a Christian was in fact indeed a miracle, and therefore you were a sign, and you were also a wonder. And so don't, don't, don't miss this. There's a comparison here of likeness of what Jesus does and what you are through the miracle of the new birth. By a miracle, you become children of God. And you are a sign and a wonder. What do signs do? Think of driving. Give you direction? Warning? What else do they do? Guidance? That's right. And so you have this idea of being a sign or a wonder, and that's exactly what you're supposed to be. Remember that Peter said that we have been brought into his marvelous light and to proclaim the praises of him who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. To proclaim is to tell something or to be a sign. That's precisely what Jesus came the first time, was to proclaim and to be a sign. Remember, Jesus was reading out of the scroll of Isaiah and he says in this in this very day, in your ears, this has been fulfilled. He, he was pointing them to him being the Messiah, the, the anointed one. And this time, you are exactly what Jesus said when he said that greater things you will do in my absence. After I leave, you're going to do greater things than these. That's also hard to understand. When we don't consider ourselves to be saints, when we don't consider ourselves to be miracles, when we don't consider ourselves to be signs, it's even harder to swallow the idea that when Jesus said, Leanne, after I'm gone, you're going to do even greater things than these. Tim, after I'm gone, you're going to do even greater things than these. And you think about all the things that Jesus did. Now, what he's talking about, he's not talking about qualitative, but quantitative. He's not talking about your nature being divine, that therefore you do the exact same thing as far as the signs that Jesus did, necessarily so, but quantitative, meaning the numbers of things that are done. And so we went from 12 disciples, and we added Paul and Matthias. We don't even know what happened to him. I'm not sure whatever happened with him. We don't know much about several of the disciples, but they're called 12 men that turned the world upside down. Jesus didn't turn the world upside down. Twelve men turned the world upside down. And think about what it would be like if those twelve men trained one man a person, and then that, that person trained one, and they just kept training one person. What would happen? Exactly what happened 300 and some years later, Constantine had no, no choice but to, to, to proclaim Christianity to be a, a viable religion in, in you know the Roman Empire but sooner or later I believe that he did convert to Christianity because the overwhelming signs of what it made a difference in people's lives you know there's a lot of difference in in somebody saying I'm a disciple and somebody living in such a manner that it's indisputable that something has changed them and that's what happened to those people And they did it in the worst of times, not the best of times. Remember, in 70 A.D., the temple was destroyed. Judaism, for, for the most part, was wrecked after that, and it's never recovered. Christians were persecuted all the way up into the 4th century after Christ. They were actually used as instruments of entertainment in the Roman Colosseums, they would be torn to bits by uh, wild animals. They would be used in gladiator fights. And that's not the best of times to be a Christian. But the, the, the phrase, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the gospel, was so true. And so here's, here's the thing that relates this back to us today. If it's bad today in America... How much more should we cling to the gospel? 
and to our faith to remain steadfast to be the sign to be something different I, I was thinking on the way out the door even this night I watched on the TV tonight political opposites fighting rolling around in the streets grown men differing opinions rolling around the street how sad is that there? That was over just standing on the street corner with a, either a flag or a sign for one candidate or the other. You know, uh, one man drives up to a street corner in which some people were out there with their political signs and began coughing in the faces of the ladies. That's not a Christian thing to do. That's uncalled for. And when we can have in the midst of, and, and, and I, again, in the political context that we're in right now, when you have a person sitting before the Senate right now being harassed and harangued by hundreds of questions from different vantage points and different agenda points, and they main calm and cool, even the network news, one of the liberal channels, made mention of that tonight, how admirable that was. And that should be us as Christians. There should be something different because of that. And I think that point came across today. And it just rang to my ears as I was going out the door. I was thinking about something, about the political signs, things I heard. And I said, we ought to be different because of that. So we're signs, we're wonders, we're saints, uh, the scripture calls us. And another thing is important here. It's depending upon what translation you have, you may or may not have um, the word I in the last part of verse 13. Like as in behold, I and the children whom God has given me. It may or may not be there. Uh, anybody have that not there in your copy of God's word? What about in the phrase right before that? I will put my trust in him. Well, it's probably a little deeper than we would want to go in there, but there's that word I wasn't in the Hebrew text either. And in the latter case, it wasn't even in the Septuagint text. And the importance of that is, is that the person that we're talking about is doing the speaking here was the one who gave himself to bring us into fellowship with him, meaning Jesus, through salvation. These are the words that the uh, writer is putting into his mouth as quotations out of the Old Testament, but he's modified one of the quotes by putting the word I in there. And what he's doing, he's putting that in the first person, meaning Jesus. Jesus is claiming this, that he's going to again proclaim or put my trust, and then I and the children whom God has given me, that phrase is attached to the beginning phrase and say, I and the children that you have given me are going to praise you. And so what, what our job is, and, and I think Ravi Zacharias made this point very well in a lecture right before he died, I think, is that one of the missing gems in, in much of our church life these days is the importance of praise. We call it worship, and we think about preaching, or we think about music, but praise, what, what is really praise? And, and that's what the writer is saying here. He is saying not only that, he says, I'm going to sing praise. And we need to think about what praise is and who praise is directed to. And he is attaching that I and my children will sing praise to you in the way that is ordered here. So it's important for us to understand we just don't sing for our own entertainment. We sing for the audience of one. We yeah, praise him. Well, I think in the New American Standard, I, can't, I didn't research the Isaiah quote there, whether they're following the Septuagint or whether they're following the Hebrew in that. 
I'm reading from, I picked this up from Donald Guthrie about this particular point about the ego, the extra ego that's in here. Um, I can read it. Um, Guthrie says this, he says, the second quotation uh, may have come from Isaiah 8, 17 or 2 Samuel 22, 3. But in either case, the I or the ego is added. Clearly, when applied to Christ, the personal emphasis has a different meaning than the original context. And that's what I meant earlier when I said that when we put the I in there or when we consider this as Jesus speaking, it takes on a different context because back in the Isaiah passage, the focus that the reader, the original reader, or the hearer would have had would have been the immediate context in which they were living in. The immediate trial, the immediate uh, captivity, the immediate pending captivity uh, that, that they were seeing that was going to come from the mouth of Isaiah. And Isaiah, if Isaiah was the one saying that I'm going to praise you and I'm going to wait on you, now it's different when the writer puts a different eye in there, the eye of Jesus, the Messiah. When Jesus says that, that's all, that points us into a, a more important part that if Jesus said, I'm going to do that, how much more of an example is he for us? If Jesus depended on the Lord, if Jesus depended, I say Lord, God, the Father, then we're directed to do likewise in like manner because we are like him being his brother. He is different in being the Messiah or Savior but he is also an example to us to where to point our eyes and focus. He goes on and he says this in the, uh, he says, it is in fact a remarkable statement on the lips of the Messiah. Guthrie has taken this as now in Hebrews, we're talking about the Messiah here, not Isaiah speaking. He's saying it's a, a remarkable statement on the lips of the Messiah. I, even I, and then he adds the Messiah in there for clarity, will put my trust in him. In this respect, the Messiah places himself on an equality with his brethren. If Jesus had to trust in God the Father, how much more so do we also have to trust in God the Father? Definitely not that way. Yeah. Remember, we, we, we downplay Jesus' humanity when we upscale his divinity too much. When we say, well, Jesus would have never sinned because he was God. But we forget that Jesus was also human in the fullest sense of being human and was temptable and could have sinned if he had succumbed to it. If he had not depended on the Father, in other words. So Guthrie here is saying that, that the, the ego, the I, is added in here. And he says, if Jesus, the Messiah put his trust in him, how much more should we? He goes on and he says, he placed himself on an equality with his brethren, meaning the humanity aspect of him. And then he goes on and he says, which, which prepares for the latter statement in verse 14, that he shares in the same nature. Look at verse 14. He says, therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same. Again, this is the second reference that we've had in chapter 2 of him being like us in flesh and blood or in human nature. So it's not only in nature, but it's in physicality as well. And so Guthrie's point here is that, you know, Jesus is sharing something. He's like us in a very intimate and real way and in a very intimate and real way he depended on his father, just like we must defend, depend on the father. And so I think that's the real whole point of the, using the quotes, is again, it's a comparison, but not a comparison of difference, but a comparison of similarity. Comparing Jesus to us and drawing out a similarity rather than a difference. So, like, like many people say, um, there's many prayers in a foxhole. No atheists in a foxhole. If we know that we ought to depend on the Father, how often should we be in communion with the Father? All the time. 
all the time. And so the question is, how often are we really in communion with the Father? So just like your homework this past Sunday, you know, are you humble enough to be a learner? Sometimes you have to be humble enough to be a dependent child on the Father. You know, once we grow up to a certain level, we think that we don't need it, we can handle it, and then, bam, something happens, and then we're laying flat on our back looking up at the tiles in the ceiling in the hospital realizing that we don't have it under control at all. Then we begin to cry out, Oh, Father. Oh, Father. So, that's where I want to end tonight. We'll begin on verse 14. Hopefully we can get through 18 next week. 